question. Yeah. So I made a mess of it by putting that diagram in, you know, which meant that the carbon concentration is 1.7 instead of 1.1, and I haven't had a chance to do all the calculations again. So I'm not going to count the marks from the perlite question, okay? So is there one more person to come, or is this it? Ah, there, there we are, okay. So in the last lecture, I pointed out that, you know, with these delta trip steels, we get uh, quite a good combination of strength and ductility for automotive applications, okay, so formability and so forth. And that they are getting quite close to what's known as the TWIP steels, TWIP steels, yeah. So there are four points over here, which represent combinations of ductility and strength for twinning induced plasticity steel. So look, these are really large elongations you get in the twinning induced plasticity steel, far greater than what would be implied by your so-called banana plot, okay? So uh, I'm going to talk about TWIP steels, where the material remains fully austenitic, but the deformation mode is by mechanical twinning or by dislocation slip. And mechanical twinning basically means, look, supposing this is our unit cell and we shear, then we will get a part of the crystal changing into a different crystallographic orientation, which is basically a reflection about the twin plane. Okay, so this is the twin plane, and we basically reflect the unit cell about the twin plane. So given that we are talking about austenite, uh, which is the twin plane and which is the twin shear direction? Can you give me the indices of the twin plane? Hmm? One on one, it is the close back plane. And the shear direction? Hmm. So it's very, very interesting. You said one, one, zero, yeah? But 110 takes you from one lattice point to another lattice point. So that would not produce a stacking sequence. So what is the shear direction? It's along a 1, 1 bar 2 direction. 1, 1 bar 2 I'm using because that lies inside the 1, 1, 1 plane. This is a pure, uh, it's a simple shear. There's no volume change in twinning, right? So this is our system of uh, deformation. Slip plane uh, has a, uh, in the case of dislocation slip, we have a slip plane and a slip direction. Similarly, in twinning, we have a twinning plane and a twinning direction, and in Martin's side, we have a habit plane and a displacement direction, right? So in order to change the sequence of planes, uh, the displacement caused by the shear will not be equivalent to a lattice vector because it's only then that you change the stacking sequence of planes. So what is the stacking sequence of the 111 planes of austenite? By stacking sequence, I mean uh, after how many planes do we come back to the same location in space? Hmm? Yeah, ABC, ABC, ABC stacking. So here it is. This is our face-centered cubic. And if I look at this, I can place uh, another layer directly on top, or in this hole or this hole, which is the A, B, C positions, okay? And uh, that represents our austenite. So supposing I take a small part of this sequence, uh, A, B, C, A, B, C, and I define this as my twin plane, then I've got to change the stacking sequence by passing uh, one of these uh, dislocations which changes the location from a B to C site or C to A site or A to B site, okay? So I do that here. A has changed to B, B has changed to C. Okay. So oh, oh, these are remaining constant. 
Uh, now, if I only did this, if I only passed uh, one of the Shockley partial dislocation on a single plane, then I would achieve a three-layer thick HCP region, hexagonal close back. So you can see here it's CBCB. That kind of stacking is for hexagonal. Okay. But if I pass now the Shockley partial on the second plane as well, so that C changes to A, this remains constant now. Then I've got A, B, C, B, A, and you can see this is a direct reflection about the twin plane. Okay? So you've got to pass this Shockley partial on every single close-back plane to produce the twin. You will recover the structure, but it will be a reflection about the twin plane. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Now, how can I work out the twinning shear? the magnitude of the shear. You remember with Martin Siddick transformations, we have a shear deformation of about 0.26 and a volume change normal to the habit plane. Uh, how do I work out the magnitude of the twinning shear? Remembering that it's happening on the 111 plane and the next 111 plane will be located a certain spacing about the one below and that we are displacing along the 112 direction. So if I know how much displacement there is and the spacing of the plane, I can work out the twinning shear, right? It's simply the displacement divided by the spacing of the planes. And here is a, a plan view of the 111 plane. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the 110 type directions here, the close back directions. And if I go from this point to this point, that's not a lattice vector. It's one-sixth of a 112 type direction. Uh, and, but it will change the stacking sequence because it will take me from a B position to a C position or a C position to B position. Okay. So each A by 2, 110, which is your slip Burgers vector, yeah? and slip doesn't change the stacking sequence, right? Uh, is equivalent to two of these partial dislocations. The, in this case, because this is 110, we have 211 and one, two, bar one, because bar one plus one will give me zero, and one plus two divided by six gives me one over two, okay? So if I'm looking at a normal slip dislocation at high resolution, it's probably dissociated into two parts, A by six, one, one, two, and another A by six, one, one, two, with a stacking fold in between. And if one partial moves away, then you're left with a fault, which is what we had on the previous diagram. So in order to find the twinning shear, first of all, I divide by the spacing of the planes, which is the lattice parameter divided by root 3. Yeah, you know that d spacing, one upon, if d is the d spacing, 1 upon d squared is equal to h squared plus l squared plus k squared divided by, um, sorry, that's uh, divided by a squared, lattice parameter squared. Yeah? So it's a over root 3 is the spacing of the planes, and the magnitude of this vector is simply a over root 6 because it's, you know, 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared over 6 squared. Yeah? So you get a over root 6 as the magnitude. Divide this by this, and you get a very, very large shear deformation. So this is. 0.7071. Compare that with martensite, which is 0.26. So supposing I take this material and completely twin it, I will get a much bigger elongation than if I got the austenite to transform completely into the favored martensite. Yeah? So in principle, the twinning induced plasticity is much bigger than transformation induced plasticity. The twinning shear is much larger. There's no martensitic transformation which has a shear as large as the mechanical twin. Everyone happy with that? So your assignment is, uh, one of your assignments is to calculate the elongation you would get if the whole of the austenite transformed into the most favored orientation of twin. So what is the most favored orientation of twin if I'm pulling? 
So I want an exact answer. Exactly 45 degrees, right? Assuming that there's a 111 plane at 45, because there's no volume change. So the maximum shear stress happens on a plane which is at 45 degrees. So the interaction energy will be greatest when theta is equal to 45 degrees. That means the normal to the twin plane and the uniaxial tensile direction is 45 degrees. Yeah? Okay, so uh, this is the way to work out the twinning shear. And interestingly enough, the shear for martensitic transformation is much smaller than for mechanical twinning. Right, so these are the classic images from uh, these people who did some of the pioneering work on, uh, on twip steels, where you can see mechanical twinning after deformation, and when you put this into a transmission, uh, so this is a sample which was flat to start with, and you are seeing the surface displacements, just like you see with martensitic transformations. And this is a transmission electron micrograph showing you the complex twins you know, lots and lots of variants of twins. If you look at even higher magnification, uh, Professor de Kuman has published pictures of twins inside twins. Okay? And that doesn't mean, of course, that you don't get uh, normal slip as well. So this, this, you can see lots and lots of dislocations as well. Okay? But in general, you know, you will not get phase transformation of the austenite in a trip steel because it's a stable austenite. And you get a tensile curve which looks like this. Uh, it's fully austenitic and maybe the austenite grain size is of the order of 10 micrometers. Uh, so it's not very strong to start with. You can see the strength is quite small. Right? Now you can do many things to increase that if you wish. But the classical trip steel starts off quite weak, and then there's a huge elongation. There's a work hardening rate which is very large. So why do you think we have a large work hardening rate, given that we don't have any phase transformation? Yeah, twins act as? Hmm? Yeah. So, uh, the twins that we saw are basically dividing the austenite grain into smaller and smaller and smaller compartments as the deformation progresses. So you know when we refine the grain size, the material gets harder, right? So this is called a dynamic hole patch effect, where the twins are partitioning, that means dividing the austenite grain into ever smaller regions as the volume fraction of twinning increases. There are other, other effects as well, but this is a, a very strong effect where you basically subdivide the austenite grain by deformation. And it's this work hardening that prevents the onset of plastic instability. And that's why you get this very large elongation. Now, a typical uh, composition uh, would be something like this. Very, very high manganese concentration. Um, you know, we, we can, uh, POSCO even makes much lower manganese trip steel, like 15 weight percent manganese. But the original focus was on very high manganese steels. Uh, there's some silicon and there's some aluminum as well. And again, the fact that you have silicon and aluminum reduces the density. So this is not 7.8 grams per centimeters, but it's 7.3 grams per centimeters. And it's fully austenitic, and its properties are very good even at cryogenic temperatures. So you can see here, this is the impact toughness which is a very high value, you know, 100 joules in a choppy impact test, maintained over a large temperature range. Because, you know, austenite doesn't have a ductile brittle transition temperature normally. Yeah? Ductile brittle transition temperature happens when the cleavage strength becomes smaller than the flow stress. 
So your flow stress needs to be very temperature sensitive in order to uh, be very high at low temperatures and therefore cleavage becomes easier. And in austenite, the flow stress is quite small and not temperature sensitive. And therefore you don't get a ductile brittle transition. So you maintain your toughness even at very low temperatures and indeed at high strain rates. Having a high strain rate is the same as reducing temperature as far as plastic flow is concerned. So the properties are very good in terms of you know, formability and uh, in terms of uh, getting a high strength after forming and even the toughness. The difficulty with manganese is in the processing of the steel. You know, manganese evaporates very easily. So to make a high manganese steel is very difficult. And you know that there is a lot of research going on on that aspect alone. OK. The role of the manganese, silicon, and aluminum, or one of the roles, is to control the fault energy. Right? So if you have a very high fault energy, then it's very it's unlikely that hexagonal closed back martensite will form, epsilon martensite, or even alpha prime martensite, because alpha prime martensite, that's the body centered cubic martensite, uh, often nucleates at intersections of epsilon martensite. Yeah? So if you have one epsilon martensite plate like this and another one like this, you nucleate alpha prime at the intersection. So to control the stacking fault energy, you need your manganese, silicon, and aluminum as variables. Uh, but you can actually design a steel which will partly transform by twin, uh, partly deform by twinning, and it might have some martensite and epsilon martensite or alpha prime martensite. So for example, with this composition, when you pull it, you generate the alpha prime martensite. Uh, with this composition, I'm not sh oh, okay, yeah. So this, uh, with this composition, you have a mixture of ferrite and austenite. It's not even fully austenitic. So alpha is the ferrite, and alpha prime is the martensite. Uh, as you increase the manganese concentration, you are losing your epsilon martensite, uh, your alpha prime martensite, and eventually you get to your standard trip, uh, trip seals, where you get no transformation. And of course, uh, the commercial alloys also have uh, about 0.6 weight percent carbon. So that helps to make the austenite stable to transformation. And you can reduce the manganese concentration. Right. This uh, shows how manganese influences the driving force for the formation of epsilon martensite. So if the stacking fold energy becomes negative, you know, the difference between the FCC and HCP sta states uh, is basically the stacking sequence, then in these alloys you would tend to get uh, epsilon martensite forming, but once you go beyond a certain amount of manganese, uh, you just deform by the twinning and slip mechanisms. Right. Have you seen this picture? You must have seen it many times, right? So uh, what is interesting about this picture is that when you draw a cup, you lock in a lot of stresses, residual stresses. Yeah? So there are internal stresses inside the material. And if, if you put a slight cut on it, for example, they would tend to come apart, just like a rubber band. You know, it's got a stress in it. So if you put a cut, the rubber band will break, right? So this was observed that after, after some time, these cups would break up. And the effect is associated with hydrogen getting into the steel, combining with the residual stress, and causing almost brittle fracture on a microscopic scale, right? And the solution is very simple, that if you add aluminum to this steel, then this effect more or less disappears. And you get much reduced sensitivity to hydrogen. Now, there are many mechanisms by which people explain the effect of aluminum. And one of those mechanisms is that you alter the stacking fault energy, right? For, uh, for uh, some people argue that these cracks are associated with small regions of martensite forming. 
but you can also find them when there is no martensite in the vicinity of the crack. But in that case, stacking fault energy would be important. Other people say that um, hydrogen influences or, or reduces the strain hardening due to carbon. Now, if you reduce the strain hardening due to carbon, then in regions where there's a lot of hydrogen present, you will get very easy plastic flow, and that amounts to brittle fracture because the rest of the material is not flowing. Yeah. And the latest uh, idea coming out from uh, GIFT is that aluminum causes a small dilation around it. Yeah. So if you look at the bond uh, lengths around the aluminum atom in trip steel, they are larger than between iron and iron atoms. So the hydrogen tends to be trapped. And then it is not segregating into regions of high concentration. Okay? So that, those results come from first principles calculations. And they also mean that the aluminum containing trip steel will absorb more hydrogen because these are traps. Okay? And for the first time, that explains why the aluminum containing steels absorb more hydrogen but are not brittle, right? Okay, so just to summarize, uh, both trip and trip steels, what we are doing is we're taking advantage of either transformation or twinning under the influence of an applied stress, externally applied stress. And that has the effect of work hardening the material, which therefore stops early plastic instability, and therefore you get great strength and ductility. In the case of the trip steel, the work hardening comes from the fact that you are producing hard martensite in the structure. Very fine but hard martensite. And in the case of the twinning, it comes from the fact that you are dividing the austenite grains into smaller and smaller regions and therefore making it more difficult for plastic flow to happen. Now, I'm going to switch the subject. So here we are doing externally applied stresses, but you can actually generate residual stresses inside the material uh, by many, many industrial processes. Okay, so we've had one example, which is your deep drawing, where you build in residual stresses. But even more important are the residual stresses that arise from welding operations. So suppose a material develops an internal stress. Can we engineer the material so that it transforms and cancels out the internal stress? Okay, so this is a totally different application of TRIP, where the TRIP actually destroys the internal stresses that exist. And that should be very good for the health of the component. Yep. So let me summarize what welding means in the, in the present context. So we've got these two pieces of steel, and they've got to be joined together, so there's a gap in between. And the vast majority of wells involve fusion, that means liquid. So you deposit liquid in between these two, and when that solidifies, you've got a joint. Right? And it's one of the most critical operations in all engineering structures. So you can imagine uh, that this is not just a small piece of steel. It's connected to many things, right? So it's not going to be able to shrink as the liquid shrinks. And therefore, you will accumulate stress. And that's illustrated here. So if I, if I draw this to indicate constraint, that means those walls cannot move, right? Because they're connected to lots of things. Uh, this is liquid. You cannot have any shear stresses in a liquid, right? Liquid can flow. It then becomes solid. Once it becomes solid and starts to contract as the well cools down, you build up stresses. Okay. And those stresses will reach the yield strength of the material. So even before you've applied an external load, you will have residual stresses approaching the yield stress at a high temperature. Yeah. So that's, that's not good. Uh, that will enhance the corrosion rate. It limits the load that you can apply because in many cases you can't give a heat treatment to remove the stresses. Yep. So we need to do something to put in here which will cause this spring to expand. 
So if you design the material here to undergo transformation under the influence of internal stresses, then we get rid of those stresses. So this is an rig, it's huge. It's in the, in the North Sea. And uh, you know, if you, if you look at how deep it is, it's, uh, it's actually about 10 times the Houses of Parliament in the UK. Yeah? So huge engineering structures and all put together by welding. And these are your pipelines going through Alaska or Russia or wherever in cold weather, and they are welded. So if you have residual stresses inside your material, they are bad for the pipeline. So let's do an experiment, all right? Uh, we take a tensile specimen like this, and we hold it rigidly at high temperature here, where it's fully austenitic. And let's assume that this is an austenitic stainless steel, so it's not going to transform at all. So if I hold it rigidly, when it cools, it will build up a stress. Yeah. So that is the stress that it builds up. And actually, this stress is smaller than due to thermal contraction because the material yields plastically as well at high temperatures. Right? If, if there was no plastic yielding, it would be really steep here. So this, before we've applied any external stress to this component, it's already accumulated 300 megapascals. Right? And austenitic stainless steels are not very strong anyway. So that's quite a high stress. Now supposing that I make this material out of something that will transform to bainite, right? So here is the same experiment, but using a steel which will undergo a phase transformation to bainite. Uh, you can see first you build up the thermal contraction strain, uh, stress. As soon as transformation kicks in, the stress drops dramatically because the bainite is forming along orientations which will cancel out the stress. Okay. Trouble is, it exhausted the transformation at 400 degrees centigrade. So once you've transformed the austenite, you get a rapid rise because bainite is quite strong, so you don't get the plastic relaxation. So that's made the situation much worse, right? So how can I, how can I make it better? How can I design my steel so that I avoid this rapid rise? Uh, if, if the transformation gets exhausted, I'm in trouble. Yeah. If I've consumed all the austenite, there's nothing I can do, right? So what do I have to do? What can I do to stop this from happening? I've, I've got to move this point to this location, right? By alloying. And just to show you an example, uh, if I take another steel, which doesn't transform to bainite, but only to martensite at a lower temperatures, then you can see that I end up with a smaller stress. So ideally, I want this point to be at room temperature. Okay? And only martensite can do that. Yeah? I, I, can't allow, I can't get bainite forming at significant rates at room temperature. I'll show you tomorrow an example where it takes about a thousand years to form bainite at room temperature. Okay? So we can't wait that long. Uh, so I need to design an alloy in which the martensitic transformation finishes at about room temperature. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we have a problem, right? That uh, you form martensite in a weld, then the engineer will say, you are crazy, right? Okay. So, you know, you make your welding material so that the martensite continues to form to room temperature, but you have to satisfy all these other properties. So alloy design is not easy. You have to maintain strength. It must not be susceptible to fatigue, to corrosion. Uh, toughness must be good, and uh, the fracture toughness, K1C, must be good. So if you're making martensite, then you know, 
to normal people, Martin Sight is a bad thing. But you know better, right? How can I make Martin Sight tough? Go back to the first lecture. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, so what do I do to the carbon? I get rid of it. Yeah? You can get Martin Sight without carbon, right? You just need to add other alloying additions. And, and welding involves small quantities of material. Yeah? So you can afford expensive elements like nickel for example yeah so you need to suppress the transformation temperature using uh, other elements than carbon so that you get ductile martensite okay right so um, there are various ways of doing this and i said to you nickel right nickel is good because it increases the toughness of ferrite or, or martensite and the reason is to do with the change in the core of the dislocation, which makes the dislocations more mobile. Yeah. Uh, and if you make the dislocations more mobile, then the flow stress uh, will decrease, and therefore cleavage becomes less likely. Um, the trouble is, for nine years, we tried to make such a material and never got good toughness. Okay? And until one very bright student decided to make a mathematical model of toughness and produce this plot here. So the conventional thinking is that if you add nickel, the toughness will improve. Yeah, it's in the textbooks. It's in my textbook. Yeah. So if I look over here, as I increase the nickel concentration, yes, the toughness increases. But if I look over here, it actually decreases. So it's not generally true that nickel will increase the toughness, but for various reasons, at low manganese concentrations, it will increase the toughness. The actual reason is as follows. Okay? So we made, first of all, we made these three alloys just to test this idea. Here, we should get poor toughness, and here, we should get good toughness. And here you are, you can see. Uh, this one, very good toughness. This one, these two, not very good toughness. Okay? And the physical reason for that is that at high manganese concentrations, you produce these coarse, coarse structures. Right? They're called coalesced bainite, where plates of bainite just join together to form a single crystal. And then you get poor toughness because cleavage cracks can propagate across. Okay? So that's a long story I'm not going to go into. But you need to know that nickel doesn't always improve the toughness and that when you design a welding material you've got to control all the other properties not simply the transformation temperature yeah so here yeah, this is a standard welding material which transforms at a high temperature so it's a commercial electrode yeah, which you can buy and these are the electrodes that we developed. You can see that there is large concentrations of substitutional solutes, but the carbon concentrations are always very small yeah? because we want a tough material. Even in the standard welding material, the carbon concentration is kept small because with a welded joint, you have no choice. It's the solidification structure which provides the strength. Yeah? Uh, the early experiments that I showed you, these, uh, 1977, you can see, they were done using that tensile specimen. Okay? But you can now do this in a synchrotron, and that way you can follow the transformation behavior and many, many other features. Yeah? So you just do the same experiment, but bombarding it with very high G X-rays and interpreting all, all the information. So uh, this is, uh, uh, if you like, a small tensile testing machine. And the X-rays will come through the synchrotron window when he's away from it. And then we can collect much information in addition to stress. So for example, this tells you the volume fraction of austenite and ferrite by X-ray diffraction taken frequently as the material cools, because these are high energy x-rays, so you can collect the information rapidly, yeah. you know, every 30 seconds or so. 
And these are the corresponding stress curves. Okay? So first of all, look at this commercial electrode which transforms at a high temperature. So if it transforms at a high temperature, then it will build up residual stress very quickly. Right? So that's the purple color here, and you can see a very high stress at the end. The others are low temperature transforming alloys. You can see the transformation temperatures, and you end up with zero or negative stress. Okay? Uh, if the transformation induced plasticity overcompensates for thermal contraction, you end up with a compressive stress. Okay? Now, these are very simple tests. You know, they're, they're not actual welds, and an uh, actual weld is much more complicated. So, uh, and you can't use x-rays, because x-rays penetrate very shallow into the material. You know, even in the synchrotron, you are going through about one millimeter of material, where the weld is much bigger than that. But neutrons can do that job. And these are data from neutron diffraction, where you are plotting stress contours here. This is an actual weld, and this is the commercial material. And here you can see a compressive stress of minus 600 megapascals with the low temperature transforming alloys. So that's a good thing you have cancelled out the residual stresses that existed inside the well metal. Uh, we are applying this concept to many things, including this object here. Okay. And in that particular context, you need a stainless steel. Yeah, not, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the compositions here, none of them actually are stainless. You know, for stainless, how much chromium do you need? Let's say 13 weight percent, right? Uh, none of these would be stainless. Yeah? Therefore, they would corrode in certain environments. Now, of course, if I make it stainless, I still want to form martensite. Yeah? The, uh, I don't want it to be austenitic stainless steel. Otherwise, we don't get the trip effect. So we've got to get rid of the nickel. Yeah. So chromium concentration has to be large. Uh, carbon is definitely not wanted here, even for corrosion. Because when you weld, you will cause, in a certain region, the precipitation of chromium carbides, which will cause corrosion. Okay? It sensitizes the weld. And Kyung Kim's group have shown that even in the absence of carbon, sometimes you get segregation of chromium, and that can induce the corrosion. Uh, we want a low MS temperature. Uh, if we get it too low, then we'll retain a lot of austenite. That's also not useful to do. Uh, so we need to suppress the martensite start temperature with solutes other than carbon. At some temperature, it should be fully austenitic. Otherwise, we have nothing to transform. And there's a particular reason why we want it to solidify as delta ferrite rather than austenite, because delta ferrite can absorb impurities more than austenite. So if you solidify directly to austenite, you might get hot cracking. Yeah? So you see, a design problem is really complicated. All of these criteria have to be satisfied. And the alloys were designed. So this is the chromium concentration. and. Um, basically control the martensite start temperatures. This is a commercial alloy, right? And you can see how much carbon there is. Uh, we have uh, designed the alloy to transform at about 200 degrees centigrade. And apart from monitoring the stresses, you can also monitor the distortion, because the residual stress causes distortion, right? So you know uh, when you look at your spring back, that's basically a distortion because of residual stresses, right? So. This is the um, low temperature transforming alloy, and this is the normal stainless steel electrode. And you can see the distortion is much bigger in the case of the non-transforming material. And if you're looking at a ship, you know, yeah, you build up the distortion. So it looks really terrible if there's too much distortion. Yeah. I don't know if you've uh, been to the shipyards here. Have you been to Hyundai and uh, Samsung shipyards? Uh, or seen it on TV, where they try to control the distortion, which occurs from welding? 
Okay, so we've seen that um, an external stress can induce um, transformation plasticity, and that can be an advantage because it adds to work hardening. Right? We can also use transformation plasticity to cancel out residual stresses which arise because of whatever manufacturing process that you are using. But you have to get all the other properties correct at the same time. Okay? Right. Now, tomorrow will be the last lecture where I'm going to talk about the world's first bulk nanostructured metal. Okay, the world's first bulk nanostructured metal designed using the phase transformation theory that you have learned. Yeah? Okay.